very much like what Vermont did. So I'm hoping that we have the same luck they do. Finally, I have our last panelist. And this is one of the most important groups that's with us because these are nurses. Yes. Sue Cannon is a registered nurse. She is representing the California Nurses Association, a leading organization in our fight, health care reform here and nationally. The nurses have been an inspiration for many of us as we build this movement and continue to provide leadership and resources so we can move forward. They are one hell of an organization. <laughs> Senator, who has 
back the bill that we are so grateful for. We need uh, is here. Because we know that 
as many as 500,000 children each year will miss school That's right. due to tooth decay. Mm -hmm. Tooth decay alone will keep a half million children mm -hmm. from getting to school this year. Tooth decay, which is prevented. You can prevent tooth decay. But 8-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds have never seen a dentist. And of course, if a kid misses school for whatever reason, health-related, because they can't get to a doctor, guess what? They're going to fall behind in their studies. And if they fall behind in their studies, they're more likely to become disengaged and they're at a higher likelihood of failing in their studies. And if a child fails in his or her studies, he or she's more likely to drop out before getting a high school diploma. And a child without a high school diploma is seven times more likely to find his or her way into our criminal justice system. And then we wonder why we're spending more on the Department of Corrections than on higher education, which we know, of course, Public education is the best crime preventive tool known to her, uh, humankind. So we're doing it all that We've got to make sure that our kids get the health care they need when they need it. I, I remember very clearly, I'm sure there are other people in the room with the same story. In the fourth grade, I could suddenly no longer see the blackboard. Yeah. I couldn't see it, I couldn't read it, and my studies got very hard and my grades fell. My parents took me to an eye doctor. I was nearsighted. I got glasses. I could suddenly see the world again. It was that simple. But for many kids, it's not that simple. It's an impossibility. And they fall behind. And their entire futures are put at risk. And the safety of our communities are put at risk as well. So all of these dots connect. And that's among the many geniuses of single-payer universal health care. And the situation don't mean to be a downer on a beautiful Saturday morning, but it's not getting better, it's getting worse. That's right. 25% of California, that's almost 10 million people in California, at some point last year did not have any health care coverage. 25%. And that's just an unsustainable number. And of course, it's not as if health care needs just evaporate if we don't attend to them. Of course. And Sue told us, she'll find them in her ICU. People who can't get their medical care when they need it will finally access it when they're much more ill and at the most expensive point of delivery, which is the emergency room. So we know we can do better. We've got to continue to beat this drug. I know you know that. I mean, I'm looking at the most beautiful people here today, people who have been so committed to single payer for so very long. And the idea that we're going to start a statewide campaign for a healthy California and build our coalition, we have all been through campaigns before. We know how to do it. We just have to focus, figure out the pieces, begin to identify our precinct captains, identify those in labor who can help us fund this over the coming years, and of course, like everything else in California, of any importance whatsoever, it will be decided at the ballot. Our SBA 10, we can get with sufficient Democratic votes, and I'll get to that in just a minute, to the governor's desk and accomplish this legislatively because it's a simple majority vote because there's no money in it. It's the policy part of single-payer universal health care reform. There's also the financial part of single-payer universal health care reform. That would require a two-thirds majority vote in the legislature. We know we do not have that, and we will never have that. You know, I'm often asked, what's the most surprising fact of life in Sacramento? And my sincere and ready response is the severity of the partisanship. My Republican colleagues, and my Democratic colleagues, and I are completely, totally, absolutely out of our minds. We don't know what or why we're talking about. Now, of course, coming from San Francisco, I've never worked with an elected Republican before, so it's all been to me. We think the same with them. The difference, of course, is that we're right and they're wrong. Now, I say that with a smile on my face because it is our elected responsibility to find common ground so that we can craft thoughtful and effective public policy to move California to a brighter day. But on this issue of health care reform, there is no, unfortunately, no common ground to be found. When we were debating Schwarzenegger and Nunez's 
health care reform a few years ago, which many of us here did not support because it wasn't what we wanted to get to. In any case, it did get held up in the Senate. It did not go forward. But when it was debated on the assembly floor, I remember Republican colleagues, one after another, rising to state that health care was not a civil right. It was a privilege for the fortunate few. They say this out loud because they believe it. So that's the lack of common ground I'm talking about. So we won't get a two-thirds majority for the financial component of single-payer universal health care reform. We know that already will have to go to the ballot. If we were successful, and if we are successful, in getting a 10, the policy part, to the governor's desk, signed into law, we will also have to expect, through the referendum process, that the insurance industry would spend, what, 50, 100, 500 million dollars to try and overturn it at the ballot, at the same time, we're trying to find the money to w run a winning campaign to get the financial part of single payer into place. So if one way or the other, all gets decided at the ballot. Now that's not to say it wouldn't be great to get this to the governor's desk and to have him sign it, and it would. And he was right though, our legislature has changed in recent years. You know, uh, there's a lot to criticize about term limits. Uh, I, I would suggest that we're all in office beneficiaries of term limits and we all soon become victims of term limits. <laughs> if it weren't for term limits, Willie Brown would still be in my old assembly seat. <laughs> I would never even have made it to the legislature. So we come and we go and that's the, the nature of things. Uh, do keep in mind that there will be a term limit reform on the ballot in 2012. And so whereas we currently can serve up to six in the assembly with a potential, and I underscore the potential, eight in the Senate, with half as many Senate seats as Assembly seats, like a game of musical chairs, yeah. we all don't get one. So rather than a po potential 14 years, it's going to be reduced to 12, but allow members to serve in any combination of houses. So one could settle in to 12 years in the Assembly, and that's going to stabilize the legislature. There'll be less campaigning, less fundraising, more focus on the policy work you send us there to do. Like it wasn't an opening, you just chose a house and you did your work. Right now, of course, if, whenever there's an opening in the Senate, every assembly member is suddenly running against each other to get there, and it impacts their votes. They don't want to ostracize the support of powerful players, and so, again, less focus on the policy. So, with regard to A10, last year, we had to struggle just to get it out of the Health Committee. I think we're all aware that we had some disagreements with the chair of the Senate Health Committee, both on 810 and also on AB 52. But we reached an agreement with Chairman Hernandez that we would get it out of his committee and we would then take it to appropriations and it would stay in appropriations until January of 2012. Keep in mind, each of the other times that we have introduced single-payer health care reform bills. She was two times in 06 and 08, when I did it in, uh, ten, in, uh, in uh, 9 and 10. We've always done it as a two-year bill, meaning that we didn't want to win or lose in the first year and potentially have a veto and then not have a vehicle, not have a bill alive right. for the second year of the two-year session, because just the fact of the bill being alive is important. Mm -hmm. So that was not a hardship for us to tell the chair, not to worry, no harm, no foul, help us get it out of your committee, we're not moving it forward this year. He still had some concerns of how it was going to intersect with the Affordable Care Act and some other questions he asked, so we will be taking it up in appropriations as a two-year bill in January of 2012. And of course, I will be making every argument that this is of no cost to the state. We know that. Of course, we remember how it was spun just a couple years ago that, and we didn't get much help out of the, out of the legislative committees that suggested this was going to cost California $200 billion. And my response was, yeah, that's what we're spending on health care now. We're just going to take that same $200 billion and spend it in a more efficient and thoughtful and accomplished way, thereby saving them. It's not a new $200 billion. Yeah. 
So we'll be making that argument again. And every year that passes, of course, health care costs only continue to rise so much faster, upwards of four times faster than our economy. And there are only two ways that we pay for our health care costs. One is through increases in our premiums and deductibles and co-pays and out-of-pocket expenses. And then also we pay for health care at the state level. And keep in mind about a third of our entire $85 billion general fund state budget is represented by some health care costs, a third. So with the increasing cost of health care in California, our general fund continues to get <coughs> squeezed. And so the other way we pay for state health care costs <coughs> is through taxes. But if health care costs are going four times faster than the economy, and taxes are tied to the growth of the economy, this is an unsustainable equation. We'll never keep up. We'll never catch up. So we need to contain the cost as well, of course, protect all of California's right, God-given right to affordable and accessible health care. And that's what single payer will do. So I'm happy to take a few questions. I know we got a lot of work yet to do today. I'm always honored to okay. be asked to join you. <coughs> One to... more thing before Chris. Yes. Yeah, we're going to just ask uh, a wonderful man to speak for just a very few minutes. And if you could take a wonderful seat. A wonderful seat. <laughs> <laughs>